we are going live in 5 4 3 2 1 we are live now good evening good morning good afternoon wherever you are in the world thank you for attending this uh, webinar on our book on orthopedic implantology the name of the book is handbook of orthopedic trauma implantology and um, dr ashok sham will be doing the introduction but he's delayed in traffic so i'm going to start with the first talk and it's about the story of the book every book has a story in it and today i'm going to tell you the story behind this book now i've been working in orthopedics since 1986 nearly more than 3 and a half decades and we have been witnesses and participants in a sea of revolutionary change almost everything i learned as a junior resident is obsolete um basic orthopedic principles the pillars and concepts of orthopedics have all turned around by 180 degrees what are the changes we have seen in the last 38 years i've been working 38 years exactly and we've seen we've seen the changes in surgical incisions in surgical exposures of fractures the way we protect our neurovascular uh, structures the way we handle our soft tissues the orthopedic general instruments the very purpose of the operation the surgical steps the goal of surgery all these have changed in addition many of our tools have changed like the usage of the c arm the advent of the 3d ct scans the furniture we require while we are doing an operation an orthopedic traction table radiolucent hand tables etc material sciences have also changed along with it the metal alloys we use the polyethylene the flexible reamers anesthetic techniques have undergone a sea of change with their regional blocks their new antibiotic regimes the intensive care support which we receive and with it surgical techniques in, by using mipo minimally invasive surgery indirect reduction of fractures entry points for nailing and also the specialized orthopedic equipment we have but what has changed the most perhaps our orthopedic implants one of the pillars which has completely changed because if you put a modern implant beside the one we used nearly 4 decades ago you can really see the difference now the science of implantology has very little academic work on it what you see in literature is basically has been put there by commercial companies and yet metal work is, was introduced by lane in 1895 more than 100 years ago nail started with kunshna in 1939 and became popular during world war 1 and more during world war 2 there is virtually no documentation of the thousands and hundred thousands of implants which we have used in traumatology in more than 100 years so uh, when i started thinking about this um, idea i did a internet search in 2018 like we all do when we want to uh, we plan something and i found that the when i punched in orthopedic implantology or orthopedic trauma implantology it revealed almost nothing there was no mention whatsoever of uh, orthopedics whatever little was there was about dentistry and it said that it was the it was a branch of dentistry dealing with permanent implantation or attachment of artificial teeth in the jaw that's all it says and this term had not been used for orthopedic surgery before though we do i'm sure much more implantation of metal than the dentists do and today if you punch the same word orthopedic implantology you will see a book a picture of a book and virtually nothing else so i think this is sort of the first project on the ground i'm sure there will be many which will follow but then we were able to coin this terminology orthopedic trauma implantology along with this book now if i have an x ray and that shows a fracture where do we what is the best implant to fix it and where do we acquire this knowledge do we ask a colleague do we whatsapp a group 
Do we look at the internet through the uh, company brochures? Do we talk to the medical representatives, the, the various commercial enterprises, or should we look at orthopedic literature? Um, has there been a manual before? Yes, there has been one very good manual, the AO manual, but the AO manual has had several limitations. The main being that it is the product of one commercial institution and it therefore ignores the work of all other groups who have done innovative work. So AO has their own philosophy, which they always try to pro propagate naturally, but not all major orthopedic implants have been invented or even accepted by AO. So the AO work is fantastic, but it is incomplete. So a book on this subject was really, really, really necessary. And that is something we realized in 2018. So initially, when I was uh, associated with two major trauma groups in India, the NAILS group, the AOTS group, I listened to umpteen debates in various conferences about this discussion, should we put a nail, should we put a plate? And nowadays, of course, we're talking about putting nails and plates. So if we had a grievance fracture, what was superior? Was it a plate? Was it a nail? If it was a nail, what type of nail? If it was a plate out of the eight different types of plate, which one would you use? There were so many different types. And why did the designs keep on changing? So let's have a quick look at this. So initially, if we look, just think about nails and plates. The open K nail was the first thing used for diaphyseal fractures. And metaphyseal fractures were often treated by open plates. But then gradually, uh, plates started being used for diaphyseal fractures, mainly in the arm and forearm, but they failed in the lower limb. The nails, which were open, became closed. Anti-grade uh, took over from retrograde, and the locking mechanism started. Then nails started encroaching on the metaphyseal system, on the metaphyseal bone, and the PFN was as an example, and longer plates then started encroaching on the proximal and the distal shaft. Like you have several plates where you can use for the uh, proximal and even shaft of the femur, which are which which can survive. Nails became more versatile further with more locking options. Plates became anatomical. So the list goes on. Nails were closed procedure with indirect and approximate reductions. Plates started becoming meeple. Some plating, platings were even done closed as the fracture site was not even opened. And in nails today, we are talking about, we've gone back from indirect reduction to perfect reduction, circlage wiring, and plates beca have become multiple. We are using several plates for the same fracture, such, such as in the wrist, sometimes in the proximal and distal tibia. So this list just goes on and on. So with these ideas in mind, I had written to uh, Springer Nature about doing a 300 page book of limb implants. And we had a lot of discussions and I think they saw the potential of the project because I, I suspect they also did a thorough literature search and found nothing. And they knew that the um, AO manual was very, very successful internationally. So they suggested that please don't do a 300 page book, go for a MRW. So that was a new term for me. And MRW, which is what the book finally became, is called is a major research work. Now, this uh, book, they told me, had to be very comprehensive, almost like an encyclopedia a handbook, what they call a handbook atlas or like a textbook. It should have at least 50 chapters and there should be a minimum of 1000 pages. They said you have to present tertiary literature and go through a complicated peer review process. And after doing uh, various discussions up and down through, through the, with their London office, they agreed, passed us, passed us on to the Singapore office, which did all the paperwork and then passed us to the New Delhi office. At this stage, we are still talking about adult limb fractures because I thought that we could perhaps do a thousand page book on limb fractures. But that was not to be because I started talking about this with various people. And um, then a lot of individuals like, like Professor Ramesan, who is here today, uh, insisted 
We were sharing a room in one of the conferences. He absolutely insisted there should be a pelvic section. Then Professor Johari, um, he said there has to be pediatric trauma. Dr. Chinmoy Nath, who is with us today, uh, Professor Johari could not be here. He said you have to have a section on spine, otherwise it remains incomplete. So finally, we accepted all these viewpoints and we proceeded and eventually, as you know, the book became 2,200 pages, 1,500 plus colored illustrations and with 157 authors. Now, we had decided that we'll write this book, but how do we plan a chapter? So this is from the chapter which was uh, sent to me by uh, Professor Peter Baibathala's team, the, the art of team, which I'm also part of, and they had asked me to write a chapter on external fixator of distal femoral fractures and another chapter on proximal tibia. And they gave very, very precise instructions like this, that how do you write a chapter? So we decided to give our uh, editors and authors a little bit more freedom. So what we did is we did, had a discussion with them and we divided the entire project into five regional groups and four general groups. So the regional groups were upper limb, lower limb, pelvis and spine, whereas the uh, general chapters were general principles, pel um, orthopedic graphs, then they were understanding the entire fractures in their totality and the change of demography leading to the change of implants etc. Um, each regional chapter was planned in this way. We asked the authors to find who was the original inventor, who was the original innovator, the year, the relevant geography, and then discuss what implants were available, how did the design change, what were the failures, what were the challenges, what were the successes, what were the improvements, and the indications and contraindications of each implant. But you have to remember, this is not really a technical, this is a technical book, not a book about history of implants. So it was all technical, but we also thought it's important to define the history and how, why the technique has changed with time. So we, uh, these regional chapters, we asked the authors to look at the advantages and disadvantages of each design with their comments and editors, but we told them to be a little careful not to ruffle too many feathers and criticize um, implants, but try to look at the rationale. We also ask them to look at the recent advances and the possible future and give uh, literature support with relevant diagrams. So 40 to 50% of this book we've planned was, would be in diagrams. And then that would again vary with the section, section of the book. So regional implantology had more diagrams than the thinking chapters. Again, the general section we divided into various groups like nailing, plating, external fixators, prosthesis graphs, then biomechanics, metallurgy, etc., orthopedic infrastructure, miscellaneous, etc. And then we also dealt with these sections in the regional group as well. So the style of the book, two of the books which I really loved reading and when I was a student was one was Hutchison, the other was Last. So we said, let's go for an easygoing, chatty style, which was not always possible, but it should be like a textbook. It should not read like a journal paper or a review article. References had to be tertiary. No cut and paste. We told them very careful, no plagiarism. And of course the English has to be good. So these were the, the two of us, uh, Professor Bibeth Haller and myself, we were the original editors. And then we were joined by a phenomenon who is here today, um, Dr. Sasinder, as you know, he has been part of this project for the last three years and he made, I think he was a tipping point because he did so much work and he went into so much detail that we could finish the project long before we thought we would finish. And of course, there are many others, Ravi, Rajiv, Rajiv is here today and Professor Dasde and Devo Brotha. Devo Brotha could not work with us for very long. He had to go, he shifted to England, but he was very helpful in recruiting many of the people who joined the project, including Sasinder. Then there was Professor Shetty, Mr. Ajit Kumar, uh, Satish Mutha. I'm just mentioning a few names and uh, Professor Ujjal Devnath, who will be one of the panel speakers today. And many others, you can see Dr. Chinmoy Nath, Dr. Kamineni, 
uh, Professor Ramesh Sen, Professor Johari, etc. And uh, uh, Shiva and uh, Vivek Trikha, John Mukhopadhyay and Kade Gode. These wrote, they wrote fantastic chapters. So we told the individual authors, choose a topic you're interested in, don't, but don't start writing immediately. Think, think, think about the problem. Read the relevant literature, discuss it with your colleagues, plan your chapter, discuss modifications with your editor, and only then start writing. So we give them a lot more freedom. And then we did a SWOT analysis because we felt we were told by our publisher, you're trying to write the Mahabharata. So the strengths and opportunities were that it was a very new book. It satisfied a, a void in medical literature. The target audience was huge, doctors, nurses, technicians, PG students, libraries, reference books. It has the potential to be a bestseller like the AO Manual. And there was a lot of individual and interest among the authors. The vast pro uh, projects were unlikely to be replicated in a hurry. And this is a living book. So the book will keep on changing with time online. The weaknesses were that communication with several foreign authors and editors was not easy. Doctors are busy. Literature support was not easy on many topics. Editing software was not perfect. There were legal issues and it was a vast undertaking. But something that really helped us was COVID because COVID suddenly made busy doctors less busy and they were homebound. And this is really a classical case of converting a crisis from an op into an opportunity and many busy doctors enjoyed the joys of academic writing. So to summarize, my father once told me, try to contribute to science. Well, here we have not invented anything. There's nothing we have created. There's nothing original here like a new implant or operation. But what we've tried to do is documentation, analysis, and interpretation of what is available. Our work is very similar here to a Google map. If you want to go somewhere, you need a comprehensive map. You need to know where you came from, where you're going to go forward. You need to know the road ahead and the options you hope you have. I hope we can act together to keep this momentum going so that this, this project and further projects like this are finished satisfactorily. And I want to say one more thing that the original ob objective when I had, when I thought of this book was to have individual uh, implants uh, documented and analyzed. This has really not happened. This book is still mainly generic. We've discussed mostly the principles. It still does not document individual implants. Now to do in individual implants, you need a physical and online museum to document individual things. But that will cause call for lots of money, lots of expertise, time and effort. So, but this has already been done by several scientific committees. There are seed banks in the world which store different types of seed. There are microbial banks across the world. So there's no reason why we can't do it. We have to find a way so that we can make a physical and an online museum so that this important knowledge is not lost to the world and the scientific community. Thank you very much. Okay, so I hope that is sort of an introduction, and uh, I think Dr. Ashok Sham will do an introduction later when he's available, but I request uh, Dr. Peter, uh, Peter Bhavathaler to please talk about, talk about his topic. Arunjan, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, I am really honored to be a co-editor for this fantastic work. And um, I remember very well when you visited me uh, here in Munich and there was already some ideas about this sparkling in your brain and we were discussing about it. And um, I was um, excited to be a part of it and uh, want to thank all of the co-authors and of course, Sassi who did a fantastic job to bring this um, to a success. And I think the book is really a fantastic success. Success, and I will show you why it's so um, why it's so important that we we need something like this. So, um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. But, yeah. You need to. Yeah. Okay. 
it's fine. So these are my disclosures. Of course, I am, as uh, many of you, a surgical trainer for several implant companies. Um, and as um, Arinjam, you mentioned this already. So the the term implantology is is something which is coming out of the the dental area. But um, as you mentioned also very correctly, we implant much more than uh, than the dental guys. So I think it was uh, it was really the time for a book. Um, regarding on um, orthopedic implants and especially in trauma implants. So how does everything start? It? And um, you mentioned the AO already. And um, the AO is somehow the motherboard of all of our implants because um, they started, they were the first who started the scientific um, development of implants in research. So there were some attempts before, but this systematic scientific approach, this was uh, developed by the AO and it was by um, a symbiosis of two guys. It was uh, Maurice Müller and uh, Robert Mattis. And you see here the picture of him. He was um, he was somebody, he was a, a, a craftsman who was working on this machine. And so he created the implants and you can see on the left-hand side, one of the drawings of the very first um, cancerless um, bone screws he developed on this machine. And you can see on the right-hand side, the first images. So um, as you mentioned, the first implants were pretty easy, pretty simple, something like this. This was 1961, round hole plate. Um, and with these plates, they started a fantastic history of success but this history has not only its roots in the implants um, it had also its roots in a certain kind of organization thing so you in these days you were not able to buy any um, any AO tray without going through a course which means that you have to learn to use your implants before you use them. So you know this probably today from this no train, no use philosophy of, of several implant manufacturers. So in the beginning, that's, that's what it was. It was two screws. It was cortical and um, cancerless. And it was two sizes. It was small fragment and big fragment. It was two type of plates. And everything came in stainless steel. That, that was it. In the very beginning, that was it. And um, I personally am completely convinced one of the reasons for this worldwide success for orthopedic surgical therapy was that every case in this early area, really every case was analyzed and observed in a standardized manner. You can see on the right-hand side how it was done using those cards in these days. And, um, and it was done standardized and systematic. So... Um, the AO guys in the beginning, they were able to recognize extremely fast if their implants were a good development or not. And then they changed their program extremely fast. So nowadays, and Arinjim, you mentioned this already, we have plenty of material. So we have a lot of metals. We have all kind of steel alloys. Um, with chrome, with nickel, with molybdene, vanadium. We have several titanium alloys. The, the strongest is this um, titanium-6, aluminum-4, and vanadium. It's called protosul. We have cobalt-chrome um, alloys and uh, a lot more. So this is now a lot of, of, of metal, metallurgical uh, knowledge. And we have a lot of plastics too. We have peak polyethylene and uh, polyurethane. A uh, lot of um, plastics where we also uh, have to be aware of what we are doing with. So I want to give you a very short case report uh, why this is so important. So this guy, uh, a 58 year old man, he was a truck driver, really heavy smoker, um, alcohol. And uh, what happened was this, uh, he had a, a, an accident. He, he didn't recognize that. He was driving in the traffic jam, so he had a very bad accident. And he had this femur fracture. This was done in another hospital using this nail, 
which um, I think is absolutely perfect. But what happened six weeks later was he got an infection, as you can see on the CT scan, uh, probably you can see my mouse. So we developed here infection. And um, so he was then sent to our facility <clears throat> because it, uh, it was a specific recon case. And then we did everything. We did multiple revisions, local antibiotics, debridements, revision nails. Um, you see absorbable antibiotic cement, non-absorbable antibiotic cement, all different kinds of fixatives. But uh, we were not able to um, come over their infection. And so you see at the end, uh, we even tried a conservative approach, but of course this, this, this did also not work. So we were a little bit with our back at the wall. And in this situation, we started research and uh, we were lucky because in these days, um, about uh, two years ago, a new nail came um, out um, by a company who produced a specific surface um, with, um, it's called Bactigard. And you can see what they did is they, they put a specific alloy using those material here. And this is, this, this alloy in the surface is causing a kind of local element. So there is current. And this current prevents the bacteria from creating a bacterial film. And we then thought, okay, probably this is a good idea. Um, and this guy, um, it's our last option before we go for amputation. We try this nail and this is the surgery. You see what I did. I uh, first of all did another debridement. Um, in these situations, it's not so easy to achieve the correct ankle. So I always do this using those key wires as a saw template. So I have the correct um, axis. And then uh, we put the nail in and you can see post-operative, it looks promising. And then after 12 months, he came to healing. So you might say, well, centrally, there is still a gap, but he built bone um, here on the medial side and the bolts are not ruptured or not broken. So this is for me always the best sign that something has come to healing. And this is an example how Implantology helps us out um, in difficult situation and how new development can do this. So another example, locking mechanisms. We are all aware about um, locking screws. They came up about uh, 25 years ago. And you see on the left-hand side, these are monoaxial locking mechanisms. And you can see on the right-hand side, polyaxial locking mechanisms. And Probably you might think that all kind of polyaxial locking mechanisms do give the same strength of your screw, but this is not true. As you can see on the right hand side, there is a really significant difficult difference between the load and failure power you need to dislocate the screws in these three type of implants. And this is what Arinja mentioned so well. We must be careful because a lot of information about implants we find online is made from companies. And of course, they don't want to have their implant in the bad view. So um, they will always have it in a good view, which means if we want to know which one is really the best, we have to do our own studies and things like this. So um, studies about comparing different implants are extremely important. So um, if you gather all of this information, this was one of the purposes of the book, and you will find a lot of information in the book about all of this. Same thing about polyaxial locking mechanisms in small plates. This is, I, I depict on the left-hand side, three different type of lock, polyaxial locking mechanism in small plates. And as you can see, every everything of them has a little different idea. Um, what they all have in common is that the screw is somehow uh, modifying the, the thread. What does this mean for us? This means you cannot change too often the screw and the length of the screw. This means you must really know which kind of locking mechanism you have so you can be sure that you can change your screw at least once. 
And especially this is something which might be true for all of those new plastic plates you can see on the right hand side, where you have a hard screw in a soft plate where the screw is creating a new thread. And you can imagine if you change the screw, then the second screw will somehow find a new thread, but the third screw probably not. So you must be very, very aware of this, how often you can change. And this is something these questions are answered in our book. Why do we as orthopedic surgeons have to deal with this? You might ask yourself, and I tell you why. This is another case, probably a simple, simple case. It was a clavicle fracture, and um, somebody put in a new plate. Well, the company guy came and said, ah, this is a very new plate, and fancy with holes for stitches, things like this. And this was a, a very high manager of a big car company and it broke and he went to law. And, uh, and, and what he did there is he put this broken plate to the electron microscope of his company. And I show you the pictures he, he gave me. This is really interesting because you can see here what the company obviously did. It was a titanium plate. It was countersinked uh, using a CAD. And those stitch holes, which were originally planned in a positive manner to somehow fix soft tissue, those stitch holes, they um, have those chipping tracks. You see, I, I painted with my arrows those chipping tracks. And these chipping tracks, as you can see, they were predetermined breaking areas. And there the breaking rolled through the plate. And this was what he what he demonstrated with this picture. So it's important that we orthopedic surgeons, we have to know about these things because we are the guys who are endangered and we won the lawsuit because we could demonstrate here that this was a problem of the company. And uh, by this, the European regulation created a new, um, a new regulation about medical devices. This is the so-called MDR. This is something I'm sure everybody of you has heard already. Um, and what they are, uh, what they want is that um, they want our implants, which are at least class 2B or 3, to be tested by clinical studies or by biological safety studies to prevent something what I showed you uh, with this plate. And even more important is something I want to show you here. So this is uh, endoprosthesis, which looked nice and it has an extremely good ingrowth, but the problem is the connection of the head to the shaft is something which is also breaking. And as you can see here, it's really a big problem. And uh, to prevent this, it's really good um, that if you know about implantology, you can keep yourself out of trouble. This means, let me take things together. Implantology is an extremely important thing that you know what you do. This is me in the OR. And to summarize everything, nowadays we have an extremely broad spectrum of implants. And um, Arinjab, you showed this already. And everybody of you is familiar with this really huge broad spectrum of implants, uh, which is good, of course, because we have many implants specifically designed for specific anatomic sites, we have specific nails uh, with specific elastic modules, which give much better bone healing, of course, we have this surface components. So we have a lot of implants, but this means we somehow must um, be aware um, of the different um, of the different uh, um, ideas of these implants. This means um, a systematic overview was really missing. And this is the reason why I was really um, excited when uh, you came to me to talk to, uh, talk to me about the idea of this book, because I also felt very strongly that we need a systematic overview. And at the end, it's almost 3000 pages. So it's really a good overview. So the solution for everybody who is dealing with orthopedic trauma implants um, is in this book. And now I want to thank you for your attention and looking forward for your questions later. Thank you, Peter. This is a fantastic talk. Uh, learned a lot. So I'm going to ask Sasinder to tell us about 
some of the editorial aspects of the uh, what went into the making of this book. Thank you, Irmin, Dr. Arindam, and Dr. Peter. The, um, there was a very good uh, discussion about what into the what went into the making of the book and uh, what exactly is there in the book with a lot of examples. Thank you. And thanks for this wonderful opportunity. I would like to share about what went behind the book, um, the behind the scenes of the book editing. So, I'm Dr. Sasinda, Professor of Orthopedics from uh, Puducherry in India. And also on certain editorial roles in these journals. Okay, so going to the story, what happened is somewhere in 2019 or slightly before that, Dr. Arindam Banerjee and Dr. Peter Baibatal had this idea. And then uh, early 2020s, I came into picture and then there was COVID. And suddenly in 2023, there was this book, but not all was easy. It was not a smooth sale. There's a lot of hard work behind this book. So what happened? What happens with through Stringer Nature is um, just like in any journal editing, you have this editorial manager. The most common uh, site that is used as editorial manager, similar to that, Stringer Nature provides a, a, a book managing website that is Meteor. This provides an author's view and an editor's view. The view is something like that. You have a list of chapters that are under your um, supervision or under your responsibility. And um, for the author, when you click on one of the chapters, you have the possibility to either download or upload a manuscript and um, make certain comments or ideas or corrections or uh, questions to the editor. You can add edit authors or uh, you can delete authors. And finally, you make certain declarations. You have to be very careful about the copyright issues, whether you are reusing certain images from other publications. Those kind of declarations come in here. And finally, you check everything and you make the submission. As far as the editor's view is concerned, uh, you have a timeline of things that have been happening. So uh, there may be a lot of revisions that are happening between the editor and the author. So everything is visible in this timeline. You're able to make some comments and uh, requests, and then the author can re-upload his modified version, and it is visible for all the editors to have a look again. So this is what the software does and how it helps us for editing the book. And finally, you, um, you have the final chapter that is written, the journal office, the proof team puts it down, prints it down in a, a kind of a final proof. And that comes to the authors again for a revision to check for typing errors or arrangement errors. So. It all looks so easy, but is this only what the editor does? No. The editor does more than this. The editor's work starts even before the writing starts. And there is another uh, set of uh, actions that the editor has to do as the writing happens and the actual manual editing process happens after the chapters start coming in and that is the editing process. So I'd like to discuss in this way. Even before the writing starts, the, the editor starts collaborating with the publisher, frame the table of contents, list the author based on the contents. It is also very important to understand the author's, um, uh, how uh, well he will be able to contribute to this particular topic and how much time he has to contribute to this project. Also have a control on the quality of the product that is coming on or the chapter that is coming out and have a good coordination with everyone, with the other editors and also the author, this is even before the writing starts. As the writing starts, it is very essential to have constant communication with the authors and provide technical support and troubleshooting 
for uh, the writing process, for queries that the authors may have uh, in the technical aspects of uploading the chapter to the uh, software and all that. Because it is possible that certain senior authors may be very good in their clinical work and this may be a bit of the software may be a bit of an overload for them. And finally, you have the editing process wherein the editors actually go through the chapters. It goes through multiple layers of checking that includes an overall view of the chapter to check the um, uh, overall uh, picture that is being provided, the arrangement of the titles, and then the provision of uh, images, tables, etc., the language, the possibility of copyright uh, issues, plagiarism, similarity index, and finally, the smaller details, that is the spelling, grammar, syntax errors and all that this is the actual editing process but everything doesn't go on smoothly for for discussion sake i would like to classify authors into four types the first one the perfect one they are very clinically sound and deliver the chapter in the deadline within the deadline so perfect everything goes on well the second type uh, they are very capable, they are clinically very sound, they have a lot of material, but they're too busy. So they can't deliver in time, but they do deliver with some delay. That is also fine, it's good. But then we have uh, two other categories. One is clinically very good, they have a lot of material, they are too overwhelmed that they can't put down on in a chapter. This, is, this situation is kind of manageable because uh, there's a lot of material, but the author will not be able to write the chapter. So unless the editor comes into picture, the chapter is not going to come out. This is a manageable situation. We will go to this. And finally, there is a author, a proposed author who wants to volunteer. He is very much interested, but he is not clinically uh, very experienced in this particular topic. And he is not able to deliver. It is very much possible that he can keep on dragging until the deadline. and far beyond and finally the chapter doesn't get into uh, production. So unless the editor gets into picture and does something about this, this chapter is not going to go ahead. And as far as the chapters are concerned, uh, like I showed, there can be perfect chapter. The first two can be called as perfect chapters. And then you have revisable chapters where the, uh, the author is very busy and he's not able to provide it in proper shape. So. At this point, we have to act and possibly we have to uh, mix and match or as a very senior author with a slightly junior person who is able to put down the chapter in good shape. This situation is still salvageable. But the final one is an incomprehensive, unrevisable chapter or a chapter that has not been provided at all. This is a situation where you have to step in and you have to change the author or you have to change the chapter or you have to drop the chapter something some action has to be taken in the last scenario so as far as the issues were faced for each of the chapter what are the issues we faced almost all the issues possible with most of the chapters uh, there were uh, issues in content and structure possible issues in the clarity or the language because, uh, for example, uh, there were authors from all around the world. So the language can be different. The way of communication can be different. But that is that kind of variation is not great in a textbook. So the whole of the book has to have a similar language and style. The grammar has to be correct. Fact checking and accuracy has to be there. The, there is a possibility of having a lot of similarity, like 30% similarity or 40% similarity with past publications illustrations have to be new. They cannot be reproduced without permission from past publications and the references have to be appropriately done. So these are all the issues that are faced, but with proper guidance or uh, suggestions, the authors will be able to understand all these issues and take it forward with clarity. As far as uh, the qualities are concerned, I would like to divide uh, essential qualities into mindsets and skill sets. Skill sets are the, are the actual way of writing. The mindset is uh, most importantly, what I would like to stress is the passion for education and sharing of knowledge and networking abilities and 
a lot important is perseverance. You should be able to critic or review a chapter appropriately. This comes with the experience in journal article critiquing and correct it and make it better over time. And perseverance is the most important of all. For example, um, Dr. Arindam has uh, two email addresses and I have two email addresses. Between uh, 2020 and 2024, there were uh, 2,361 emails that were exchanged between myself and Dr. Arindam with one of his email addresses. The other had 1,071. And I'm not even talking about other of my email address. So this is the amount of communication that has to keep going up and down and in numerous phone calls, personal meetings, all these are very, very important and they were very important for the making of this book. A lot of things can change. The things are not going to stay stagnant as in the situations around you. COVID-19 came, there were good things and bad things about it. Um, there were a lot of, sometimes there were a lot of delays from the author because of COVID-19, but for some authors, uh, they could spend more time on the book. A change of jobs, I changed jobs uh, once and uh, I even shifted countries and project manager of Springer to manage the book chain three times. So a lot of changes kept on happening, but what keeps the book going ahead is perseverance by the editors. And what can help you in this is your passion. Without passion, it's not going to go ahead. A good mentor, someone like Dr. Arindam Banerjee and Dr. Peter Bharatala, they were very, very helpful in taking this forward. And most importantly, family support. Without their support, it's going to be very difficult. And as far as recruitment or inclusion of authors is concerned, it helps when you are well connected inside your country and beyond in order to communicate with the right people and make the right chapters written. And it's also very important to have attention to detail. Uh, this is just one uh, uh, picture, one, uh, 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 one set of images, but a lot of work went into it. The name of the patient should not be there. The image should be in black and white. It should be straight. It should be proportional. The pre-operative and post-operative x-rays have to be proportional to each other. One can be small, other can be big. The uh, equal spacing in between the images, appropriate labeling, and the labeling has to be equally spaced. All these, though they are cosmetic things, they also make a difference in the outlook of the book. Similarly, the other picture, and it also helps when you have some experience with drawing medical illustration. These are all illustrations that I drew personally, and that does help, but it does not always mean that you should be drawing all the images. There are medical illustrationists who can help you out, but some idea on this can help in advising them or guiding them into the appropriate picture. Finally, the benefit, knowledge sharing, Gone are the days when they used to say, write a book and you can earn passive income. We are not in that age. We are in an age of uh, interconnectivity. All the books are easily available. Monetary benefits should not be the one which is guiding you to write or edit a book. A feeling of accomplishment, yes. And this uh, uh, book writing or editing should not be the end, it should be just a beginning of further academic career or further relationships with all the authors and editors that you have worked with. So a take home message, have a proper roadmap before you start the book, link the dots appropriately wherever required. A good, For example, a chapter is not going ahead, link a good clinician with a good academician so that the chapter gets completed, manage your time and energy Take about your family, make them understand and uh, have them included. Be prepared for dropouts of authors or for bad chapters. Beware of plagiarism and copyright issues in order to avoid legal uh, uh, responsibilities later. But do not miss the whole plot. Don't give up on the quality. And finally, you will have a great book. That's all about it. Thank you. Thank you, Shashi. So I think everyone can understand <laughs> how it has been over the last few years. Um, I'm going to ask uh, 
Dr. Srinath Kamineli to talk about modern trends in lower limb implantology. But before that, there's an important thing that uh, Dr. Kamineli does, which is relevant to this uh, webinar, and which is that he has actually set up uh, an arthroplasty uh, online museum, which has about 4,000, um, I think, implants, different types of implants. So um, he's based in Kentucky. And uh, I will just request you uh, while you're talking about upper limb implantology of uh, just mention a few things about your, I mean, not too much. We're run, really running late on time. Unfortunately, um, we took a little bit more time than we expected, but uh, I just request you to just mention your um, museum because this is very important here. Srinath, go ahead. I think you're, are you silent? No. Thank you very much, um, Arindam. Um, thank you to Arindam, because I know this has been a, um, a Herculean uh, work of passion for him for many years. And um, also to Peter and Sessender, because it took a team and congratulations, this is just an amazing piece of work. Um, so the Orthopedic Museum started almost 30 years ago, and so we're now north of 4,000 4, implants, and we're still not, I don't think, scratching the surface. So we're working on that, and some of the implants that I'll show you are from that collection. And so it's a it's a web-based and a physical structure, so it's yet to go live because um, it's it's big. But um, Arindam asked me to talk about um, implantology innovations in the upper extremity, and I think this is... Um, <clears throat> This is best um, understood when you understand what innovation is. Greg Sekel uh, described innovation in four particular categories. The one we all think about as revolutionary categories, a complete breakthrough in either product or concept. Very few things really come into this category. Most come into the sustaining category, which is incremental refinements, either of a product or a procedure. And the, these are the two categories we'll be looking at most in this um, next few slides. But platform innovation and if efficiency innovation, we won't really talk about, but we are we have be holding to both of those in those categories. So I tried to break this down into two broad categories, technological and biological, and then we'll go into very much more specifics. But from a technological perspective, you know, we have lots and lots of innovations. I think all three speakers prior to me wow. have, have illustrated that. So from a technological perspective... 3D printing has become a very big part of what we're doing now. So you can 3D print implants, but actually 3D printing can be used for uh, printing uh, models, not only for education, but as the picture on the right, when you have a complex deformity, you can use it to plan your surgeries. Patient-specific instrumentation. So when you've got a difficult surgery, and this is an example of a central screw placement for a shoulder, which has got significant bone loss, patient-specific instrumentation based on CT scans will give you a potentially perfect placement in an extremely difficult patient. And progressing on to that is you can use technology to plan your surgeries with software, but there are now several companies with navigated surgery, whereby intraoperatively you are being guided if you are in the right space or wrong space. But now the real hubbub right now is about virtual augmented mixed realities with hollow lenses and whatever. So where this will really fall, we don't know. Um, I think it's a great learning tool and an experience accelerating tool. Whether it will become standard of practice for every surgery, I doubt. But it will find its place, especially in difficult surgeries. But it's still very rudimentary at this point. 
artificial intelligence and machine learning are other categories which will help us analyze and improve logistics. So pathology, radiology, I think a specialty should fear these technologies, but they'll also improve our billing and ability to logistically manage patients. And as uh, both Arindam and Peter said, Material science has been huge for orthopedics. Now, I'm not going to go into this, but plastics, metals and glasses and glasses such as bioglasses and pyrocarbon, etc., etc., huge influence. Biological advance, advance, advances, um, very briefly, we, we know all of these names, stem cells, PRP, BMPs, and in the future is bone bioprinting, bone printing, tendon printing, ligament printing. So very specifically, the three broad specific categories are trauma, arthroscopy, and arthroplasty. So two examples that are notable of, of, of recent innovation is the intramedullary nail. Now, Kuchner was close to 100 years ago, almost, not quite. But um, now, antibiotic loaded nails have become a really big subsection and also fragment specific nails so when you have complex fractures you have a configuration of screws to hold specific fractures in place and the second part is we are seeing more and more people living longer and longer and osteopenia and porosis being a problem and when you now have parotic bone and you have a medial calcar that can't support the implant and you have all these virus deformities this intramedullary cage concept is not that new but it's now taken a different innovation and th this is now a current innovation which i believe to be a good innovation for the shoulder and for the elbow the brainchild of george orbe of skeletal dynamics who is a phenomenal brain um, he has designed what I think is the closest to a radical departure to an increment. He's taken the external fixator concept and has internalized it. So he's taken the dynamic external fixator and put it underneath the skin. And for the elbow, it converts a very unstable, unreconstructable elbow into a relatively stable construct. In arthroscopy, to briefly mention, anchors are dime a dozen. There are hundreds of anchor designs from metal to plastic to bioabsorbable PLA, PGA to all, met all suture anchors. I think the real innovation that came recently is that of the vented anchor. What that allows you to do is to allow, pretending now how useful this will be in the long term, time will tell, but it allows stem cells from the intermedullary space to seep into the interface for healing purposes. And patches, when you have an unreconstructable rotator cuff, for instance, you have to have some sort of way to improve that patient quality and patches are one of those. Not all patches are created equally. It, interestingly, the one in the middle by Smith and Nephew is the one that has the greatest literature and I've used it and it, I stopped using it because it doesn't have the structural strength. I have no financial disclosures for any of these companies, but the one on the left, which is a collagen patch by Tapestry, and one on the right by ConMed, which is called a Bibrace, very structural. So not all patches are equal. But coming to the relevance of the shoulder and implants specifically, I, I'm going to give you a couple of trends because to talk about everything is too much for a five-minute talk. But stems are becoming shorter. Why are stems becoming shorter? Well, they're becoming shorter because long stems, when they have a fracture, there's more bone having been originally violated and there's more less native bone for revisions and implants often need to be revised. Stem, sh short stems are not new. In fact, these are examples of companies with short stems and stemless, so-called. Now, stemless is not new. For, for instance, Steve Copeland had a stemless implant almost three decades ago. Now, with any innovation, we have to be prepared for new, unrecognized consequences. And just one example in each category, if you look on the black arrow, it's showing you that the implant, which is short-stemmed, has now stress shielding the very important calcar region of the humerus. And if you look over to the greater tuberosity, you'll see it's also becoming penic over time. 
Why are these two being stress shielded? Well, if you look down here, you can see this short stem has started to integrate with the endosteum as spot welding distally. So it's almost predictable these areas will be um, not seeing the force they need. And here in the stemless, you can see also there is a loosening um, zone. So we need to be prepared for unforeseen consequences. But one of the good innovations which seems to have come about is modularity and convertibility. What this means is, is when, a, when an anatomic replacement fails for whatever reason, but the stem has stayed in situ and well integrated, you can convert it. So this convertible modular concept, I think, will progress over time. And finally, the reverse. The reverse is a relatively new phenomenon in the US. It's not so new in Europe. So in this is from the museum collection. These, this is an example of a Kessel. This is a Bailey Walker. And this was provided for me by Professor Wallace and this by Ian Bailey. These were around and conceptually around from the 60s and 70s. It was, however, Paul Gramont who made them more predictable in terms of their success. And now every company has them. A very few companies have stayed true to the original concepts of an anatomic center of rotation, but the, the, it's a bewildering range. And so we can talk for days on these sort of innovations, but but in conclusion on innovation in a in a, a holistic manner, there's a frenetic amount of innovation going on in every category of orthopedics and upper extremity. Some of them will stand the test of time. Some of them, con either concepts or products, most of them will not. So you need to be aware that most of what you are doing now may not be in the best interest of the patient. Not because it's deliberate, it's because you're following the trends of the current era. So you need to understand your mindset and the mindset of others who are early adopters and who are late adopters of innovation. And you need to understand why. Early adopters are for many reasons. They're innovative, they want to treat their patients because they don't see a solution, or they need to give a new talk at a conference. Late adopters get the sense that what they're doing works, they're not having a problem. So understand motivations. But don't, never forget, the surgeon is the best innovation. The surgeon is the best technology. So innovation should never be a surrogate for gaining key course skills by the surgeon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sridhar. And uh, we will then proceed to the next talk immediately. Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee, show us your slides and proceed. We, uh, as I said, I apologize, we are running late, but I think the standard of this uh, webinar is very good. We are all learning. So uh, though we are late, I request everyone to bear with us because I think we are having a very good academic meeting. Thank you. Rajiv, take over. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, really proud to be part of this team and thanks for having the introduction. I mean, I gave uh, Sasi and Arindam quite, uh, quite a few sleepless nights and upset tummies, not sticking to deadlines and many apologies for the same, especially Sasi. So what I'm going to take through in the next, next few five or six minutes is newer trends in lower limb implants. So what are the challenges in each zone and what could be the possible answers? We start with the neck of FEMA, and this has been a challenge from time immemorial. The challenge is to get union and union without collapse so that you have a neck which is out to length and a proper valgus. So this has been a challenge. And so a number of implants have been tried. And at the moment, the, the ones that are possibly Answering some of these are the FNS, the Targon, the Conquest, and how they all work is that you have multiple screws which lock onto a plate, but they allow you only control collapse. They don't do uncontrolled collapse. So you have ability to collapse a fracture to heal, but you don't get a shot. Near conception of the biplanar BDSF fixation, and more recently, the medial anatomical plate has been a great game changer. Coming to trochanteric fractures, again, the challenge is 
union without collapse with a stable implant. Luckily, nearly all trochanters heal, but the problem with them is the collapse and the stable the implants cutting out. The answers would be the short TFN, especially with the locking system and with cement interdigitation. The recent a modification of the Halifax nail with a tri wire, which gives it better stability. The intertan with a double screw system. And of course, if all fails, we could be thinking of a primary arthroplasty. Coming to subtrochantic fractures, the problem has been always been union because it has been a minefield for biomechanics. To maintain valgus is the biggest problem. To try to do that, the most recent. Answers that we could have are the anatomical trochantic plates, the long TFN, the long intertan, which are two of these are, uh, you know, for the trochantic fractures and extension trochantic fractures. The ABP, the angle blade plate, unfortunately, has slowly died, but it is, I feel, one of the best implants that could have, that has stood the test of time, but somehow has faded out. Sharp femur fractures. The real challenges are the junctional fractures, the commutative fractures, because stability, both angular and rotational, are uh, is lacking. And how do we get around them is number one, is the entry point, especially the entry point has been shifting from the piriform fossa, the trochanter, and now we're slowly getting more towards the medial part of the troca trochanter, which is more anatomical at least, with a multangular locking proximally and distally. These fractures have a better hold. The anatomical nails with a better bow prevents penetration distally and gets a better uh, anatomical outline of the whole femur. And of course, the nail plate combo has been a great game changer, great help, especially in junctional fractures. Distal femur, the problems have been union, even if it unites with collapse. And if it's not very distal, at junctional area, the bell clapper effect with the nail, if you put in it, it sort of claps like a bell. The answers we have now are the newer distal femur nails with multi-angular screws, screws in different direction in distal fragment, the distal femur locking plate, different modifications, the perilock plate. Recently, we are looking at dual plates to give it more stability and more so the newer ones with the nail plate, the combination of having a nail with a plate which is jigged on to the nail which gives it more stability. Proximal tibia, the challenge is getting a good articular reconstruction and preventing a virus collapse and we have a whole variety of anatomical plates, posterior medial, medial, lateral, lateral raft plate especially the variable angle designed to give it a much more stable assembly and more recently the rim plate which holds the articular reconstructions while the other players do their jobs. The tibia, the challenge is getting union in length, alignment, especially in proximal and distal areas where malunion can be a major headache. How to get around it? The newer advent of the suprapatellar nail gives you a better ability to hold on to these proximal fragments, getting better alignment, getting more screws in, in different directions, proximally and distally, and adding a lateral plate to this nail. Distal tibia, fibula, ankle, I have clubbed them together into one go because here the challenge is articular reconstructions and to hold the articular instructions till union happens. That is a challenge. As well as prevent collapse at the metaphyseal level, especially with termination. The answers that we are looking for in the recent in, uh, the armamentorium implants that we have is uh, anatomical plates for the fibula, posterior tibia, medial side, anterolateral side, adding variable angle plates to that so that we have variable angle screws, which we have spoken to, uh, before. The newer distal medial tibial plate with an added anterolateral wing has made it easier for us to have both concept of an anterolateral plate and a medial plate together. Nailing of the fibula is being tried to wait for the final results. And in syndesmosis, it slowly shifted from screws to more mobile fixation in the form of suture endobuttons. The foot, the calcaneum, 
the challenge is to hold the subtalar joint and the sesthetic lentali, especially with poor skin. The answer would be anatomical plates, sinus tarsi plate, mepo fixation, especially with the sinus tarsi plate. For the talus, the problem with crushed talus is to hold the length out. The screws compress the talus fractures and the length is lost. So here, the fluid plate on the medial side actually helps us a great deal. And the modification of the space to hold the length of the talus out for it to go on to healing. The navicular anatomical plates have come in to help us out. Less francs, we have started with KYs, screws, which were violating the joints for more recently. The H plate is a great innovation, which helps us to hold the joint out for it to heal and remove it later. But the metrosal hook plates are a new innovation. Small design will not irritate, especially for the fifth metatarsal. So in summary, in lower limb, the challenges are the enormous forces, the vectors working there, the anatomy of bows, which are bent in different directions, and the challenge of getting a good articular support clubbed on to a good metaphyseal area for us to hold on to give it a good result. And the answer we have is anatomical implants and multiple implants holding the fracture in different directions. Thank you. I'm sorry. So we won't move on to the next topic on the newer developments in spinal implantology, Dr. Chinmoy Nath. Thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody. Um, I'm proud to be associated with this mammoth project of uh, Handbook of Orthopedic Trauma Implantology. Thanks to Dr. Arindam Banerjee and Dr. Shishinder for guiding me uh, to edit the spinal section of this book. Um, uh, I just uh, go through a bit uh, about the history before going into the modern trends. The history of the treatment of spinal ailment can be traced back to ancient Egypt, 2000 BC, and basic idea to use metallic implants developed in the last quarter of 19th century. And the development of the spine surgery over the last five or six de decades was astonishing. All these things uh, uh, started in the uh, introduction and uh, history chapter of the uh, of, of our book. Um, then uh, the modern era of the spine surgery came in by the uh, by the in invention of X-ray, which boosted the knowledge of human anatomy and also prompted the surgeons to use the implant in spine surgery. The first successful spinal fusion surgery was by Barton Hadra in 1891, and first. Fusion and scoliosis by Fritz Lange in 1909. There was more than uh, nearly more than 100 years ago. The other, but the actual modern era started with the with the uh, the Herculean uh, task of developing good spinal system by uh, Paul Harrington, uh, which is Harrington rod system in 41, and introduction of the heart seal rectangle with a subliminal wire by John Dobin in 1986. But all these two holds only one column of the spine that is posterior column. So that they cannot fix the anterior column. That, that is why do both these things have failed. So the new generation of spinal implants started with the holding of three columns because if we go through the spinal column, there are three columns uh, and uh, the pedicle screws are the ideal implants for this. In recent years, Significant advances in the design and functionality of the spinal implant happens because there are advances in technology, engineering, metallurgy, and biotechnology with increasing anatomical and physiological knowledge of human body that gives variety of the surgical options for spinal disorder to address. The goals of the newer developments in spinal implantology was uh, charted or written in the recent advances in chapter 106. Uh, the better stabilization, deformity correction, enhanced spinal fusion, but there are sometimes we need motion preservation 
with the stabilization in some spinal segments in some ages, uh, the patient specific implants by 3D printing is very important for spinal uh, implantology. The many well invasive approach which scripts in, in recently in spinal surgery also. So the spinal fusion surgery is about stabilization, deformity correction, and enhancing spinal fusion. So these are the implants for fusion. The spinal fusion implants are cages, rods, medical screws, clay, and different types of clays. Uh, the cage may be titanium, aluminium, vanadium alloy, peak uh, coating, peak composites as well, and the rods may be of stainless steel, and nowadays titanium and cobalt chrome to uh, give the rigidity of the rod or deformity correction. The pedicle screws can be of stainless steel and titanium. It can be monoaxial, it can be polyaxial and uh, some, uh, and nowadays in between uh, the monoaxial and polyaxial, there may be uniaxial pedicle screws and very recently the pedicle screws threads are HA coated and tantalium coated to increase the integration. So these are the some pedicle screws and rods. These are the basic uh, monoaxial and uh, polyaxial. This is uniaxial. These are the rods and these are the top nuts. This is the reduction screw for reduction of the deformity and spondyl, especially spondylolysis. This is the minimal invasive uh, pedicle screw with the tulip rods, the, the extender. And, and sometimes we need to use hooks for deformity correction. These are the deformity correction hooks. And these are the cross connector to increase the stability. So there are different types of cages to fill the void and to fill uh, uh, to, the entry to uh, support the anterior column. We started with the Harms cage. Uh, Jürgen Harms developed this type of mesh cage, and it is filled with bone grafts and then put into uh, in place of vertebral body. And then then came the expandable cage to uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the need for space. And uh, then the cages, these titanium cages, uh, have been replaced by more and more by the peak cages, polythyl ketone. And these are the expandable interbody cages, which, uh, which goes into the disc space. This is a this is a one sort of cage which can be given at anteriorly by anterior approach. This can be cage and rod by anterior approach. And there are the specific type of screws, dual threaded screws to, to increase the stability purchase. These are the uh, uh, fenestrated screws through which the bone cements can be used in case of osteoporotic spine. These are the variable angle screws. These are the uh, cages which can be fit with the screws into the vertebral body for more integration. And these are the different types of plates in cervical spine, in cervical spine with the big void with expandable cage in the thoracic or lumbar spine. This is the plate with used with mesh cage for replacing vertebral body. And nowadays plates can be uh, of biodegradable materials, uh, which is integrated into the vertebral uh, body. And there are fancy plates which are used for laminoplasty in the cervical spine. With the innovation, with the innovation of more and more plates, cages, the biology has come in with newer understanding of the biology of the fracture healing and fusion, the increased dependence on bone grafts, bone substitutes, and orthobiologics to enhance the bone healing, which may be on osteoconductive, like orthograft, allograft, bone substitute, etc., osteoinductive, like demineralized bone matrix and BMP, bone morphogenic protein. Uh, there are muscle preserving implants uh, or not always we use fusion in all cases of spinal surgery so muscle preserving is, preservation is also important there are cervical disc uh, arthroplasty like, like uh, knee arthroplasty or hip arthroplasty there are lumbar uh, spine disc arthroplasty there are dynamic stabilization system like dynasis and clofets and many uh, many a times we have to use implants but allow the, the spine to grow in case of young children so uh, non-fusion technological system like wave tar and magnetic rods are used these are the wave tar and these are the uh, growing rods then uh, we, we can use augment the osteoporotic vertebral body or vertebral fractures with vertebroplasty balloon kyphoplasty and recently spine jack system in which we use bone cement along with the jacking device to uh, raise the vertebral implants. So that these implants are supported by uh, instruments and allied devices, which is uh, written in chapter 104, the imaging instruments, optical instruments, tables and frames, and refractor systems, neuromonitoring systems to increase the patient's uh, safety and robotic systems. 
So improving patient safety techniques by initially by X-ray, then precision by CR, which can guide to pull put implants into the spine. Then intra of CT scan came, and then nowadays navigation by which is which may be CT based. CT scan based or one or fluoroscopy based navigation system. There are neuro monitoring system. This is a neuro monitoring system to uh, um, reduce the chance of nerve injury while uh, putting implants in the spine. Not operating room env environment is also important to reduce the infection. We can use, uh, we use actually the HIPAA filter, and uh, laminar airflow, modular roti, and also different types of uh, fracture tables like Jackson tables to reduce the uh, um, um, abdominal pressure and reduce uh, the venous pressure, the, uh, blood loss. Um, then okay, uh, the, to, re to increase the interlaminar space, we use the Wilson frame uh, in the cervical spine to stabilize it. We use the Mayfield uh, frame. We use different sorts of retractor for minimal invasive surgery like this. And uh, to enhance the magnification and illumination, especially for the minimal invasive surgery, we use loop. Then we use microscope, microendoscope, full endoscope, uh, UBE, that is uh, unilateral bipodal endoscopy, and thoracoscopy to put implants with uh, uh, reducing the approach site morbidity. And finally, the robot assisted surgery came, in which, which gives precision, which reduces the chance of nerve injury and reduces the, the radiation assist, uh, associated injury to the surgeons and the patients. So the take-home message is over the last 150 years, spinal surgery is progressing leaps and bounds with the help of other fields of science. The improved knowledge of physiology, pathology, biomechanics, metallurgy, physics, optics, and other allied subjects help develop better quality implants, which can be used safely, securely, and improve results and reduce morbidity. An interdisciplinary approach is very important, which can promote further evolution of modern implantology in spine surgery. Thank you very much for the, your patient listening. Thank you, Jim Boy. And uh, without wasting any time, I'll ask Professor Ramesh Sen to please talk about modern trends in pelvic fracture implantology. As you all know, Professor Sen is a world expert on this and uh, he has taught many people. So Dr. Sen, please go ahead. Thank you and greetings to everybody on the webinar. We have been talking about various implants around it. When we come to the pelvis vestibule trauma, we understand we are talking specifically for the area where there are fragments which has to be reduced and fixed. Now, in this kind of a situations, obviously, there are standard plates which have been used and our the chapters which are there in the book definitely cover each aspect of conventional implants whether they are screws, they are specific wires, or they are the conventional plates they have been used. What is happening now is that as anatomical implants are coming over to all parts of the body, they are coming equally into the ester fixation also. Now, they may not be available everywhere, but the efforts are there for the innovations to come in. And when we look at these innovations, this is a very conventional implant which was in US to start with, in Europe to go in for, that we now moved over from a conventional plate to anatomically contoured plate. Now, these kind of a plates were having the fixation either from the suprapectinal area supporting the medial side or medial plate supporting the superior side and they were pre-contoured accordingly. But the things are changing it now. People in a different places are trying different innovations. These are the plates which have come called anatomical wing plates, basically for an osteoporotic kind of a poor quality bones. And so apart from this, another innovation was because they found it was very, not very strong to support the medial side. So they came up with the implant, which is to support on a very stiff kind of a uh, hinge on the medial side also, and specifically looking at those kind of a situations. Then the, the other plate which came with its own design, again having a medial buttress to the quadrilateral plate area with a proximal hinge over to the suprapectinal area. And three-dimensional printing, as was said initially by Shirinath also, is coming up again to fit into the size of the area, a kind of a customized bone plate. 
as the com- things are coming up as designing the plates so are coming for managing these specific drill guides also for these plates which definitely will help in getting the right direction for the screws in the kind of a plate fixation because we understand in estabulum any direction of the screw has to be very right avoiding the vital structure inside and also not going into the articular area for the hip joint this was our own innovation we had the us patent way back in 2016 which had been in use right now and it has its own concept that rather being suprapectineal or infrapectineal let it be on the brim of it and this has been now giving a reasonable amount of stability in that kind of a sense this is another in, uh, innovation where i had been a part of it it is from ao group now this is a new plate which has come now here what was done was that an additional screw hole was per- provided down there to hold the ischium thus putting up a kind of a tension band kind of a principle to support this area this is already available in us and now it has recently about 3 months back introduced in the europe also and we do hope it will be available subsequently in the rest of the world now apart from the anterior side the posterior side plate application also had changes from the conventional simple plate what was done at the locking concept came and rather than simple screw a locking screws came into the being and then additionally having a long screw going into the anterior side also was got in then coming to the symphysial area there was a concept that we should have a two sided symphysial plate with a horizontal part and vertical part it is kind of a combi hole it was brought into it and very interesting concept came to have a kind of a intramedullary fixation within the pelvis in especially elderly bones the concept was that we should go through the paths through a drill guide into the area and hold the bones when they are not displaced so it was primarily for the elderly bones then there came the memory shape alloys and these memory shape alloys in the form of fixed staples can provide a stability and this stability it is coming from the depi also so with the make of nitinol they can be put in and will retain the compression uh, forces and it, it, they will undergo the repeated loading also with a reasonable amount of a bed strength and this is a, a kind of example it can be seen a strength along with the plate fixation providing it so what we have seen in uh, these things is and what we have written in the chapter is that there will keep on coming new innovations and as far as our understanding with the subject goes we get new ideas as our understanding of the particular trauma displacements come we have new implants and better implant suited for the management thank you thank you coming to the end of the lectures we have dr onirvan chatterjee is dr onirvan chatterjee here dr onirvan chatterjee are you here <coughs> yes sir Oh, uh, you're there. Okay, yeah. Anirban, please share your um, slides and uh, tell us about newer trends in pediatric orthopedics. Are my slides visible now? Yes, yes, fine. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> hello everyone, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share a few insights about pediatric fractures. Uh, as we have heard so far, we've been talking mainly about the different types of implants which have been used, and in different parts of the body. But when we talk about uh, pediatric uh, cases, we have a wide spectrum. as you can see right from the upper extremity to the lower extremity to the elbow fractures which are most common to the fractures around the hip and apart from this we have this uh, inherent problem with pediatric uh, cases that there are multiple factors which needs to be considered before we use any particular implant so these factors the prom- most prominent factor is the age and as the age of the child varies this size of the implant which we can probably use in a particular child or a particular bone also varies so the same uh, fracture femur in different age groups may warrant different types of implants at 
we are still in the era where a lot of fractures can still be managed conservatively. So the plaster of Paris is still, uh, I would consider, an implant in the armamentarium of a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. But apart from that, we also need to look at what are, where the fracture is, whether it's in the upper extremity or in the lower extremity, whether it's an open injury or a closed injury. These are factors which will determine the type of implant which we would want to use and whether it is actually an acute presentation or whether it has presented to us a little late. And finally, what is the functional demand of this particular child? As we know nowadays, a lot of our children are very keen sports persons and parents are also very keen for children to develop um, sports as a profession. So that can have a different functional demand on the child and the family as a whole. So within our armamentarium, the traditional K wires are still there. Within the nails group, we still have the uh, more specific ones, which are the elastic nails for the diaphyseal fractures, be it in the femur or the tibia or the humerus and the forearm. These are available at various sizes and they have a different method of uh, uh, providing stability as opposed to adult uh, uh, nails, which are more rigid. We still do need to use some of these older instruments like the rush nail or the rods, where sometimes in uh, very peculiar cases like osteogenesis imperfecta or a congenital pseudarthrosis of the tibia. Though nowadays, the newer implants like the telescoping nails are available for specifically such cases where uh, Dr. Chinmaya Nath spoke about the uh, use of growing rods in scoliosis so that the number of revisions or the number of times the uh, implant needs to be uh, exchanged with the growth of the child needs to be minimized. So the telescopic nails are a good innovation which we have now in our armamentarium. Within the screws also, apart from the material being at stainless steel or titanium, we have the entire range of screws apart from the special screws like say Herbert screws, which can be used for uh, specifically cartilage based injuries as well. And we now have the entire uh, gamut of plates, be it the locking or the non-locking variety, which can be used in pediatric cases also, but with selective uh, uh, indications. So within pediatric fractures, we know that not all of them can be traumatic and some of them can be pathological, uh, be it due to a neoplasm or an infection or an underlying metabolic bone disease. But the problem arises with the availability of the implants in pediatric age group. Since most of the implants are manufactured mainly in the adult size uh, 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 armamentarium or the uh, entire portfolio, Lot, a lot of companies may not actually have a pediatric size available. And since the pediatric size varies from a younger child, a toddler to an adolescent, a entire variety or a gamut needs to be available. So we are seeing this changing trend from traditional immobilization and a plaster class to an implant-based fracture fixation. And why is it? Because it is less cumbersome. It is lesser risk of displacement and we can early mobilize the child and the individual as a whole. And obviously there is lesser time off from main activities, be it school, be it sports, and also the parents and the caregivers who cannot always get a lot of leave. And as I mentioned previously, that parental or expectations with sports becoming as a career option. So the advantages which uh, advances which have happened over the years is that we now have a better understanding of pediatric fractures, especially the, the child is not a small adult. And so just downsizing the implants is not going to solve a lot of our problems. And we have to also be aware of the uh, special situations in children's fractures where there might be a normal bone and an abnormal amount of trauma caused right from birth or in injuries like a special facial injuries like a lawnmower type 6 Salter Harris injuries, or those which are related specifically to a particular type of sport, be it a trampoline injury or a skateboard injury. And then there are the abnormal bones, which we mentioned about as metabolic diseases or congenital osteogenesis imperfecta, or sometimes benign or uh, malignant bone disease. Now, the management, however, still remains based on the uh, principles of alignment, stability, 
and the ability to uh, rehabilitate the child to get them back to function. So these basic principles are not changing. We are aware of the Salter Harris, though the type two is the commonest, just to illustrate that a simple type three or a type four like fracture, which looks seemingly unstable, uh, harmless on the X-ray may be actually potentially quite unstable. And that a stress test sometimes may manifest that this is actually unstable. And we could do a, uh, we could do a, a requirement for accurate uh, articular accuracy and fix it with some screws and also do an arthrogram sometimes to confirm whether this articular cartilage is intact or not. That is a major drawback in pediatric fractures because the articular cartilage is not visible on plain x-rays and we are always trying to second guess whether the articular surface is intact or not. And the arthrogram is a useful tool in our armamentarium which can help. So the treatment methods have been traditionally be traction cast or KYs with a, without a supplemental cast external fixators in certain cases, and all the various varieties of internal fixators. And as the child gradually goes older and older, as the child progresses towards adolescence and adulthood, we start seeing a trend towards more and more rigid type of fixations and more adult type of fixations and a combination of these. So the clear-cut indications are those where there is definitely a neurovascular injury or an open injury or an unstable intraarticular or a facial fracture. And relative indications include those with polytrauma or those which are impractical to be managed with conservative methods. For well, here's a case example of a neck femur fracture, which has been managed with a modification of an adult type of an implant where the standard DHS has been modified to use where we are now getting the pediatric size DHS and it has been added with a, a derotation screw. Again, a one step down. Instead of a 6.5, we've now used a 4mm system to try and address the issue. And that goes on to a good healing. In special situations like this, like we mentioned before, severe deformity with fractures, this is where the telescopic nail can be is very useful in our armamentarium. And depending on where the fracture is in a, a pathological fracture, again, whether the type of implant, the choice is very well uh, decided by that. So here's a case example of a path fracture through a bone cyst. And now we have these special type of pediatric hip plates wherein we can address these uh, fractures very well rather than having to rely on only adult size implants. Another case example where a titanium nail has been used here, you can see a path fracture through a bone cyst and that is showing gradual signs of healing. So the new initiatives which we are seeing nowadays are the availability of bioabsorbable implants. And uh, obviously there is no need for an implant removal, but the tissue reaction and sometimes the sterile discharges which have been reported in literature still is a cause of concern. But it is heartening to see that there are newer uh, literature support to this. So these papers coming out in 2013, 2015, 2017, even though these are smaller series, but they are reporting cases where they are using these implants and uh, the risk of implant removal is reduced. So that reduces the uh, OR visits for a particular child for a particular fracture. And that is definitely beneficial, not only to the child, but also to the family as a whole. The other initiative uh, which, is in, which has been gradually uh, brought in is the role of 3D printing. Now, this has gradually come into pediatric orthopedic surgery, though more so in, uh, not in acute fractures, is more so with the delayed presentations or deformities, where we can uh, get uh, specifically three-dimensional uh, models printed, jigs can be pre-designed, and the exact osteotomies can be planned, and then uh, the time for execution can be reduced intraoperatively. So these are innovations, and I'm sure these will gradually bring uh, come out or into the uh, pediatric other fractures, fixations, especially pediatric pelvic injuries, this is in a small uh, but evolving uh, area as uh, more and more high velocity injuries are there. We are seeing more of such injuries. And that's where probably like Professor Sen just mentioned, 3D printing is an extremely useful uh, solution. 
So to summarize, there is definitely a changing trend in pediatric fracture management. This is mainly because of our improved understanding of fracture healing, the remodeling potential, and the anatomy and the healing of facial injuries. We now have a lot more of uh, specific pediatric size implants. We foresee a good future in the availability of bioabsorbable implants, and 3D printing will definitely help in planning and execution of complex fractures and deformities. I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, everyone. I think we have come now to the end of our um, talks and we'll proceed to panel discussion straight away. Uh, Sasinder, please take over the first panel. I think you're with Dr. Ashok Sham. Ashok, are you here or are you at another meeting? Dr. I'm Ashok here, Sham, sir. are you here? I'm here, sir. Dr. Anirban, um, can you stop your screen share? Yeah, Oliver, great talk. Thanks, fantastic. Okay, so yeah. uh, uh, Sasinder or Ashok, would you like to call your panelists and then? Yes, sir. The thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anirban, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Radhakam Pandey, I know he has uh, come in from the theater. Uh, I'd like to shoot my first question to Dr. Radhakam Pandey. He has um, authored a chapter on uh, computer assisted implant fixation uh, choices. Uh, my question to Dr. Radhakam Pandey is um, nowadays, precision is a key thing for surgeons as far as uh, surgeries or uh, fixations are concerned. Where do you think, what is the role of computer-assisted navigation in fracture fixation? Where does it stand today? So, uh, computer-assisted navigation is basically a surgeon's friend. And if you want to put an implant somewhere, which is a bit difficult to, whether the deformity is, severe or there is significant bone loss and you want absolute precision where you want to put your screw, then a computer-assisted navigation is absolutely key. It empowers the surgeon to be sure that they will execute the plan they have made. Uh, say, if you're doing a glenoid where the approaches are very difficult and the, the you may not have good exposure to put your screw bang in the middle of a glenoid, then it, if you have a CT, the computer navigation can actually guide your hand as to where you put your screw. Spine, pedicular screw is another very, very important area where you have to get precision and you have to eliminate almost all the error because uh, the either the bone quality is not great or the bone amount of bone available is not adequate and you have one shot at a particular uh, implant, then computer navigation comes in handy. Nowadays, many fractures, you have to do a joint replacement, uh, especially if you're doing, say, proximal humeral fractures, many times proximal tibia fractures or acetabular fractures, many times you have to go straight away to an orthoplasty rather than try fixation. And that is because we are living longer a lot of elderly patients is very, very complex injuries. And in those cases, following a CT, and if you, uh, we've talked about 3D printing, and if you have a 3D printing, on top of that, you have a computer assisting you in what direction your screw should go, what direction your wire should go, that just empowers you significantly and reassures the patient that you're doing your best to give the best possible result in a very, very complex situation. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. I think it summarizes very clearly what is the role of computer-assisted uh, navigation. I think there is a definite role, but uh, the access to this particular innovation or the latest advance um, may not be uh, available uh, in all places, but I, I'm sure it's going to change over time. Um, I would like to yeah. ask the next question yeah. to Dr. Can Deepankar. I just make a point? Yes. Uh, just, just few months, a few years ago, robotic surgery was a dream. 
And I know you guys are doing robotic surgery in India. And I'm sure computer-assisted technology is not far behind. It will come. Yeah. Uh, we can see a lot of uh, even small hospitals have come up with robotic surgeries uh, in India. And uh, there is a lot of advance in that. I'm sure uh, the day you said will come soon. Um, the next question is to Dr. Dipankar Sen. Uh, Dr. Dipankar, uh, we often use external fixation or Elizero for uh, definitive fixation of fractures. So what will be your uh, indications for uh, usage of external fixation or Elizero fixation for definitive fixation of fractures? Uh, Dr. Dipankar, you are muted. Uh, yes, um, establishing the indication for external fixation, fixation for a primary fracture healing is relatively, uh, I will say rare, but um, probably I came across situations and when I had to put a fixator and when I look back, I, I had a thought that, well, this can be an indication. So I have, I have put fixators in patients who had severe head injuries. Um, my colleagues, uh, they did the head injury, whatever primary treatment, and I just took the opportunity to, to visit the theater and I just uh, put the fixator nicely and I could get a good reduction. But then I didn't get a second chance to go back and put a nail. And when I was offered the second chance, that was almost some eight to nine weeks. And I was impressed to see uh, that the fracture has united by that time. So, and and uh, this has been on a couple of occasions in our uh, institutions. So probably I will say uh, in situations like this, uh, when you have the operation, uh, the option of quickly going in and coming out, the patient is uh, unfit for surgery. You put the fixator uh, with the, with within in, in your mind to get a primary healing. So you reduce it nicely. Uh, fix it, and then you may not need to go back later. Uh, you 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 probably will go back just to take the fixator out, and if necessary, put a PTB cast or something like that. So I will assume that this can be a possible indication for attempting to get a fracture healed by primary application of external fixator. And by external fixator, I mean a simple fixator. Uh, Elizarov uh, as a primary healer. I really don't foresee it, and, and I'm not very comfortable with the Elizarov other than the uh, tibia fractures, rest of the body, it, it's a bit cumbersome. Uh, so simple fixators, uh, pins and, and clamp and bar, or the if you have those uh, costlier option of uh, LRS or something like that, you can use it. And that's all I can think about uh, primary application of external fixator to achieve uh, fracture healing. That's my opinion. Thank you, Emma. So that was very clear. I think Dr. Ujwal is not here. Um, Dr. Dipankar, I have another question for you. Can you give us an overview of how you choose an intramedullary nail versus a plate in general for a shaft of long bone fracture and which is better over other conceptually? Well, long bone fractures, if we talk about the option of plate and nail, uh, probably we have three bones to talk about, the humerus, the femur, and the tibia. For the humerus, um, it's a simple mid-shaft fracture. Uh, you can even treat it still today, conservative. And if you really need to choose, uh, I, I for a simple transverse or mildly oblique uh, mid-shaft fractures, probably I will choose uh, a simple nail because it is relatively minimally invasive. Uh, it's quick. Uh, it does the job, and you can get it get away with a fractured union unless you you do it not not properly. Whereas for the humerus, putting a plate, I know that you can do it by MIPO techniques, uh, but again, you need to ex have a decent exposure upwards and downwards, or if you go by the uh, approach the mid shaft by the <clears throat> lateral approach, it's a relatively longer incision. 
Now, if the fracture is such configuration that you need to generate or you need to, you must need to have a good interfragmentary compression or there is a segmental fracture or comminution, se severe comminution, uh, where you need to bridge the situation, then you, you go for a plate. That's, that's I'm talking about the humerus. Uh, for the femur, uh, again, I had, uh, I had a situation where I had to, uh, I have to say, I, bite, I had to bite my tongue in that case. I had a hugely morbidly obese uh, girl whom just, I say I was carried over. I had, I had put the face in for fixation and for nailing. And I didn't uh, arrange for the, uh, the, what I mean to retrograde nail. And I could see that uh, there is no way I can get into an anti-grade entry point into the femur. So in that situation, I had to open the whole femoral shaft uh, almost from the top to bottom and put a long plate. Luckily, the plate was there in the in the inventory. Uh, but yes, this patient also could have been treated by a retrograde nail. Uh, so putting a plate in the femur, I really see that uh, exceptional situations and putting a plate, you need to have good four into two eight cortices on either side. Uh, again, put the patient on partial weight bearing or non weight bearing, all sorts of problems, massive exposure. So I really do not foresee unless you do not have the correct size or correct nail with you. For the tibia, when we when we talk about, yes, a fracture into the junction of the proximal one-third uh, and distal two-third, that is the region uh, I will normally prefer a plate because this is the region where it is difficult to get it accurately reduced and hold the reduction by the nail. So if we need to expose it, that area, why not taking a chance of generating a good interfragmentary compression by applying a plate? So, so this is the way I, I look into that. Otherwise, simple diaphyseal fractures, uh, transverse or mildly oblique, probably most of the situations we can get carried away, we can, we can get it done by a standard uh, intermediary nail. That's the way I look into it. Thank you, Arman, sir. That was quite clear. Uh, my next question is to Dr. Peter Babatala. Uh, Dr. Peter, we often see patients with polytrauma. Mm -hmm. For example, there is a patient with femur, tibia, and an upper limb fracture, for example, a humerus fracture. How do you manage such injuries? Um, do you always do them in a single stage? If uh, or what what is your advice? If you if someone is working in a very acute OR setup, what do you advise? And otherwise, what do you advise? Okay, thank you very much. This is a very important question, and uh, we have a lot of experience with these really bad multiple trauma patients. So, um, we we learned during the last decades that um, it's, it's, um, it's smarter um, to go for a kind of damage control um, access, which means what we do in the initial phase, we stabilize the patient, um, we try to um, uh, correct um, correlative problems, and we put the uh, fixatives on all kind of broken bones and stabilize the patient on intensive care. And then after the patient has stabilized, we go for a step-by-step -step, um, repair of all of the fractures. And by that, it's that we start with uh, the lower limb before the upper limb. And if you have so-called chain fractures in the lower limb, so we have femur and tibia and something like this, then you always start with the distal part because um, this has several advantages for you. If you start with the distal, it's, uh, it's easier to uh, get the correct axis and it's much easier um, if you imagine you try to put a femur nail in and you still have the fixator on the tibia, it's not nice. But on the other way around, um, you can you can fix the tibia pretty nicely, even if you have a fixator on the on the femur. So this is my recommendation. Um, if you have chain fractures, start with the distal, and then go to the proximal. 
And we try to, if the patient is stable, we then try to operate as much as possible in, in one surgery. Um, but as soon as if they show any kind of instability or pulmonary reaction, we we stop and wait again until he's stabilized. Okay. Is she? Are you there? Um, I don't know. Has he lost Sasha, the connection? You are on route, huh? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think he's lost the yeah. connection. Like that. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. So, I'm, I'm uh, last question on this panel discussion to uh, uh, Dr. Naren Agarwal of Springer Nature that can you tell us a little bit, give advice to future authors and editors about how they should plan about writing this book, uh, a book, any book. Tell us a little bit about the process which Springer Nature follows and how authors and editors can you know, improve their performance. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you, Dr. Indam. Um, and first of all, thank you for inviting me to this event. And I realize I'm the only non-surgeon uh, person invited here. Um, this is a great book that has come out. I would like to, first of all, congratulate all the editors and the uh, high count of authors who have contributed to this really huge work, almost a tome of three volumes. And uh, when we were talking about the book just before the COVID, we were not sure that the editors would be really able to pull it off, but you guys have done a fantastic job. And uh, thank you for publishing with Springer Nature. Coming to your question, I will be quick. Uh, we have a very global program, international program, with editors commissioning books from various locations across the world. We have several in Europe, then in Asia and in Americas, which means it's a very international program. And all these books are mostly or majorly read in the digital format through our e-subscriptions, which means that typically we are looking for a book that is globally relevant. So uh, our first um, uh, um, evaluation or assessment is that it should be a book relevant for the readers globally. Second is that uh, the authors uh, need to be aware of the existing literature or similar books in the market and then work on the appeal of the book. What is unique? What will stand out in your book for the readers? What are the hooks you have in your book that is going to make your book very appealing? So that appeal or the hooks are extremely important if you are thinking about a global uh, level book. And this is something also we very carefully evaluate. Another thing is that um, books can consume a lot of time. You have to spend a lot of time away from family. You have to commit yourself. So please ensure that you have the right kind of time to commit yourself to a book uh, before you really dive into the actual job of doing it. And also, you should be very sure about the collaborators, that you are going to have the people you are in, you have invited would be uh, submitting their contributions to you in a timely fashion. This book, for example, has taken like four years now, but then it's a book of a different nature and different size and scope. And this is fairly a good time. But typically, our books take about 18 months. And... Um, Editors have to uh, uh, make sure that they have invited the people who have the time and they also have a plan B if some authors kind of uh, drop out of the project. So I will keep it short. Think of a globally relevant topic. Plan, plan, plan uh, your entire book. Look at the, think of the right hooks or the, the appeal factor of your book because it is going to be a global uh, book made available worldwide in both digital and print formats. That would be all in short from my sign. And finally, if you are thinking about a book, please get in touch with us. We would be very happy to hear from you. Uh, I believe my team would be reaching out to some of you people individually to talk about new projects that we have been thinking of. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Arindam, Dr. Peter, and Dr. Sasinder for really steering this project, huge project to its conclusion, which is really awesome. So 
thank you so much. That would be all from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agarwal, and thank you for all the help and cooperation which you have given us and the Meteor software and, you know, helping us at every stage. Uh, without much ado, we will proceed to the second uh, panel discussion, and I would like to invite Samu, please. Samu, please read the name of the panelists on this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you, Arindam, sir, uh, for uh, introducing me. Uh, I would now like to invite the second panel team, uh, Dr. Karthik Vishwanathan, uh, Dr. Uh, Srinivas Kabapati, Dr. Uh, Devabrata Kumar, Dr. Ajit Kumar, Dr. Christian Lozano and Dr. Ashok Sham. I hope Dr. Ajit and Dr. Ashok Sham are not available online. Okay. Can I please I think he, yeah. he might be here. He's, we can see him here, but he might be with another meeting as well. Okay. 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 So I'll just shoot the first question, uh, Samu, and then you please shoot the second one. So my yes, first sir. question is to uh, Professor Lozano. And the question is that with increased advance in medical technology, there is in, there is people are living much longer. How should the implants be devised to help geriatric fracture fixation? And is are there a role of medications as well? in addition to surgery. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation for the webinar. Um, I think actually the main problem that we have uh, is that we have a um, big population of geriatric uh, um, people. So they have a lot of osteopenia and osteoporosis. And the type of fracture that they have are different than in a normal bone. So the main problem, I think, actually is the bone stock that we have uh, when we fix um, the fracture. So actually, the, the, I think that devices that we use um, intramedullary or extramedullary must have an impact in osteoporotic bone. So uh, about the medication, uh, there are some me medications that geriatric people take to, to prevent osteoporosis, but in most of the cases, uh, they go to the other side and they have osteopetrosis that is uh, a different condition that makes the bone very stronger. And even the type of fracture of this population are different and they are very, very uh, uh, demanding uh, types of fracture at the end, at the time of the fixation. So I, I think that at this time in every part of the world, we have a, a big uh, population of geriatric people with osteoporosis and it's the main problem that we have uh, when we don't have a stock, uh, bone stock uh, during the surgery. Thank you, Dr. Lozano, uh, for the quick answer. Uh, I think we have uh, written enormous in the chapter. We have contributed about the same. Uh, I would like to ask my next question to Dr. Deba Brata uh, from the chapter he has contributed. Uh, as we all know, obesity is an upcoming pandemic. Uh, people are uh, more towards uh, sophisticated lifestyle. And uh, there are a lot of obese patients we encounter during our uh, OPDs and uh, presenting with fractures. So if such a patient is presenting to your OPD, so how do you wisely choose the implants which are available? And how do you handle the obese patient? Dr. Debo, are you there? Oh, hi. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Um, hi. Uh, uh, Hello to everyone. Uh, in, in UK, the standard is quite practice, uh, practice is quite standardized. Uh, so, uh, in terms of um, uh, obese patient, and uh, there are certain issues with the mobilities and other stuff. So, um, uh, however, uh, uh, and uh, implant in uh, NHS, uh, which is also uh, uh, we cannot get the things the way we get in North America or um, uh, Indian system that we have multiple choice and options are all like, not like that. However, uh, for obese patient, we um, uh, tend to focus on uh, certain issues, the, the changes on biomechanics rather than other stuff. And some obese patients uh, tend to have osteoporosis. So those things we need to keep in mind, except very young and pediatric patients. Um, and uh, so uh, we uh, tend to do um, a nailing in, 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 rather than 
uh, the petting in terms of um, uh, uh, longer bones uh, because we need to make sure that the load bearing things are uh, made earliest and we, we we can mobilize patient uh, early so uh, suppose in, in terms of um, hip fractures uh, so uh, in uk uh, we still do a lot of dhss and sort other of things but in in terms of obese patients and uh, stuff uh, osteoporotic so we tend to provide um, intramedullary nailing uh, to provide early um, mobility so, and the mobility is never restricted for um, even if they are uh, obese. So, and uh, because uh, if we um, uh, keep them on bed for longer duration, the subsequent other morbidities uh, increases high. So, mobility restriction never is the issue. And in terms of other things, uh, um, uh, implant selection, so we need uh, rigid fixations. We need to make sure that uh, maybe in a few more screws um, uh, to uh, make things more stable. <clears throat> and for nailing, maybe we need to lock uh, a little more options if we have. And um, in terms of pediatric uh, uh, fracture fixation, so there are some certain studies where I was discussing with my colleague um, Shashinda where for pediatric patients, um, uh, stainless steel, um, nail uh, is more rigid uh, uh, rather than uh, titanium, uh, but for adults, uh, not much difference we found. Um, so uh, uh, these are the basic things. So focusing on biomechanics and uh, tending to make the intramedullary fixation and more rigid fixation focusing is the primary goal. That's in short, and the um, rest of the things is as per other things. Thank okay. you, thank you, Dr. Dev. Thank you. And uh, I can see that Dr. Devdal, I think he got disconnected. So I can see him now. So I'll ask him from the, he was in the other panel. So the question, we have two questions on uh, humerus. So the first one directed to Professor Devdal is, intramedullary nailing and plating in a humeral fracture, which one do you prefer and why? Dr. Ujjal, are you there? Dr. Can, you Ujjal, me, yeah. can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Well, the fracture humerus has got three parts, actually. Proximal humerus, mid-humerus, and distal humerus. So the problem that you're asking me is a very complex issue. But to make it very simple, intermedullary nail significantly increases the risk of shoulder complications. But in elderly patients who have fracture humerus, usually it is preferable to do an intramedullary nail so that you can come out of the situation quickly. Another situation is humerus fracture, middle third to distal third with a radial nerve injury. Patient has a wrist drop. So what do you do? Are you going to go and do a nail or a plate? Well, in my situation, if I have this, I will do certainly go in and release the nerve and do a plating. So this is very important. There are the indications that helps me to understand where to do the nailing and where to do the plating. Although plate fixation is very superior to intramedullary nailing for the treatment of humeral shaft fractures, it is often suggested that even if you get a patient, younger patient, sometimes I've used a 20 year old with a nail because I know this fellow, if it unites, he'll quickly heal the fracture and get back to normal and get back to his, if he's a sports person, he would like to get the nail out. So these are the situations where I use nail and the situations where you use play is again, uh, mid shaft humerus or distal third humerus, you can use a plate. And sometimes uh, I use for uh, distal, very distal humerus, we use a plate as well. So a non-union of humerus is another way where you have to use a plate because you can use bone graft along with it. It's an open situation where you use dual plate fixation or you can use a transverse fracture model where an eight hole single plate fixation uh, will be much better and much beneficial. 
But again, if you are, fractures are located between the surgical neck and prox approximately five centimeter above the olecranon fossa, you should think of nailing. So I am a 50-50 divide on this, but yeah. according to the uh, situation, according to the complication of the patient has, then I decide. Prefer, what would you prefer the shaft? Mid shaft humerus, what would be your preference? Yeah, it depends. I told you, young person and very elderly people, I use a nail. Okay. Very sure. And if it is a middle age up and 40 to 60 and a fracture humerus, even if there's a comminution, and sometimes I uh, prefer to leave it alone if it is well aligned. But if it is not, then we have to get it fixed with a plate. Okay. Good answer. Very good answer. Okay. One more question on the humerus to... Uh... Dr. Vishwanathan, Kartik Vishwanathan, and this is regarding the distal humerus. And how would you choose the plate configuration for an intraarticular fracture? How would you place your plates, and how would you how would you plan your biomechanics? Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Arindam and Dr. Sasinder. Uh, for a distal humerus fracture, uh, of, uh, I would divide it into whether it's an extra articular one because nowadays uh, the armamentarium for various uh, metallic uh, uh, the locking plates has increased so you know we have moved from a simple configuration of y y plate to reconstruction plates to uh, the more anatomically contoured locking plates uh, these were initially you know 3.5 ones but now we also have it in 2.7 configuration with various various uh, with various headless compression screws which can be used as well so if there is a coronal split fracture if it's an adult patient i'm talking about an adult mm -hmm. intraarticular fracture if there's a coronal shear pattern based on you know preoperative ct scan and you know, the mechanism of injury will use there's a you know i will use uh, headless compression screws or herbert screws or uh, they're called uh, it's a cannulated uh, headless compression screws Along with, along with uh, some sort of stabilization. Now, biomechanically, uh, the parallel plating, which means you fix both the medial and lateral columns uh, at 180 degrees, or, or uh, you know, so that 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 is biomechanically better. You also have a 1990 configuration on orthogonal or a perpendicular pattern. Uh, again, depends. If there is a shear pattern, I'll be using a 1990 configuration. If it is a non-shear and a coronal split, uh, it's a sagittal split once, I would use a, a, a sort of a 180 degree configuration. So there's adequate compression. The the motto of fixation is early mobilization. I mean, an uh, anatomical reduction, uh, stable fixation so that you can do early mobilization. So I would probably keep them in some sort of splint for probably about two weeks. Once the total, uh, the total suture removal is done, I will be a bit aggressive in terms of mobilization. Even when I uh, do dressings in the ward for pain relief, uh, uh, on the second day itself, I will encourage them to start moving the elbow, uh, have some sort of movements uh, during the dressing so that that gives them the confidence, okay, you can start, you know, pronation, supination movements. Uh, you can do flexion, extension movements gradually as the pain allows. So so that that, has, that is my approach. Thank you. Samu, next question to Dr. Srinivas. Uh, Professor Dr. Srinivas, uh, I think uh, we have uh, practiced uh, during the COVID-19 era and we have seen fractures uh, getting united with conservative management. So considering the situations we have gone through, uh, do you think that surgeons are fixing too many fractures in cases where conservative management was possible? Can you share your insights? Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, before I start, thank you, Dr. Arindam, Dr. Biba Tharler, and uh, Sessi for inviting me to this uh, excellent webinar and also giving me a part to be involved in this amazing project. It was a great pleasure and honor. Thank you. Uh, coming to the question, I think uh, orthopedic trauma has evolved significantly in terms of fixation principles and uh, indications due to the persistent efforts of the AO group and uh, improvements in the quality and design of the implants. Uh, that results are much better following fixation of some of the 
uh, fractures. And now compared to a few decades ago, as you can see uh, in, in this book. Uh, and at the same time, uh, our understanding of fractures and their healing uh, has also evolved significantly. If we take a look at uh, distal radial fractures, for instance, almost all of them were treated conservatively a few decades ago when we, was, when we started training um, due to uh, limitations in understanding and limited technology in the fixing uh, of implants. Now we have different options available for fixing these, and we have better understanding um, uh, that uh, all are not the same and know which types of fractures do well with fixing and which ones do not require fixing. Another example is mid-shaft clavicle fractures uh, for which management is uh, uh, not clear. There is a protocol published uh, recently in EJOST uh, from Bristol uh, in the UK. So the surgeons uh, following this uh, uh, protocol have managed, actually managed to reduce the um, uh, unnecessary surgeries for these cases. Uh, so we are getting better informed now, and it would appear that we are fixing more fractures compared to a few day, few decades ago, uh, where majority of uh, both these fractures were managed conservatively. Uh, but as our understanding improves, we are personalizing these decisions for the patient and the fracture in question, uh, rather than having a cookbook approach. Uh, and in some areas like pelvis, we did not have the technology uh, and approaches to fix before, but now we have various options uh, like Professor Sen had mentioned. And the other contentious area and an important one is the uh, removal of implants. Although this is, this is not a fracture fixation as such, uh, Unnecessary surgery, if it is happening, is potentially happening here. Uh, that's because evidence is not clear in the literature on the issue of routine uh, removal of implants. There is uh, no evidence. Uh, actually, if you see, there's no evidence that we are doing unnecessary surgeries. Um, but uh, as you said, COVID-19 has shown some, but we are not sure uh, whether the results of these conservative management are comparable and do well with the uh, fixation. Uh, but I'm an optimist and believe in the good nature of surgeons and uh, uh, respect this profession and that most of them follow the motto of do no harm to the patient and are doing and will do uh, what is good for the patient and the fracture in question. Thank you. Thank you. Very good answer. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Ashok Shah, um, I can see you now. Um, thank you for joining us. I have two things to ask you. One is, please uh, tell us a little bit about Ortho TV because you know when you set up this channel, I mean it was a very new thing, and I think it's the only TV channel in the world. I don't know on orthopedics, perhaps. So give your give us your insights about this orthopedic channel. And after that, I would request you since. You could not give the introduction. I request you to do the concluding remarks. Thank sure, you. sir. So first of all, thank you for organizing this program. It was a great program about a really good book. So I think a lot of viewers will be very much interested in the content of the book and what all the editors and all the authors have put up together. So it's a great book. I think it's first of its kind book in orthopedic. So hats off to all of you. Uh, about Auto TV, so we started way back in 2012. So it is almost 12 years now. And at that time, we realized that there is a gap between high quality education and accessibility to that kind of education. There is no such platform where we can access all a very high quality education across the globe. So we started with that idea. We started sourcing the orthopedic conferences first, putting up their videos online. So we have even 12 years old conferences online on the platform and we have stalwarts speaking on various aspects over, over the last decade. So that is the kind of repository we wanted to create and kind of knowledge bank that we wanted to create for everybody to access. So that was the idea about this and right now it is running very well. We have created a very good platform. We have collaborated with a lot of societies across the globe 
almost 87 societies have been collaborating with us and we have put up more than 11,000 videos on our platform for everybody to access. So I think that is what we were looking at when we could achieve it. Thanks. Thank you. And if you could just give the concluding remarks to this webinar before yeah. we... I need Arindam, can I, Arindam, can I get just one minute just to share one sure, of my sure, thoughts? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, just yeah. Um, this Go is ahead. basically taking a follow up from my previous colleagues to Nivas's things. I think COVID-19 has given us an opportunity to look back. Uh, one opportunity was to obviously focus into this academic a little bit and uh, obviously otherwise probably I would not have been able to write this chapter of the book. But the other thing which I, I am really, I feel that I must share with you that um, I think there is again food for thought about conservative managements. The reason I'm talking is during the period of COVID-19, I faced many situations when we had the fractures, but the implants were not available. And I remember three or four humerus fractures I had to treat conservatively. And I have to say their final outcome in all aspects, uh, objective, subjective, were no inferior to nail or plate or any form of internal fixation. So probably uh, it's time to have a relook into this. Uh, that uh, whether are we are we are we just generating evidence more and more in favor of the fixation? Is there a bias or or it is really there? Because the reason I'm talking is during the period of COVID-19 we had severe shortage of implants and we had to go back to the conservative and, and that also produced results. And those patients are happily moving all around of us. So it's, I think it's time for all of us to sometimes have a looking back. Absolutely, you're right. And I think the older I become, the later I realize that it's not necessary to fix all the fractures and conservative actually, they do very well. And I, because I've been following up patients, you know, who I operated long before and those I did not operate and they come back and said I had a very good result and everyone told me you needed an operation but you said you don't need it and I'm fine and you can see they have got a full range of movements so that is something I think we learn as we get older but we have to finish this uh, webinar unfortunately it would, I would love to continue for another hour so Ashok please um, make your concluding remarks and then we are nearly one hour, almost 50 minutes over, over, you know, over time. But I think it was worth it. Ashok, please do make your concluding remarks and we'll finish the webinar now. So again, thanks to all the editors and the authors for contributing to this uh, book club. So this was the idea of book club where we try to promote and bring uh, forward a really good book written by uh, surgeons and present it to the orthopedic community as a whole. So a lot of time we get a lot of books, but generally we see the books mostly at the conferences or and most of us don't really go to bookshops and have a look at the books. We look at them only on online platforms where we can get just a rough idea of what the book is about. But doing a webinar of a, on, on a book gives us a very good idea and in in-depth uh, rationale, thought process of the editors and of the authors. I think that gives very good insights about the books to all the viewers and they can actually judge how useful the book will be and then purchase it. I'd also like to thank uh, mm -hmm. the Springer Nature team to be present here and thanks for supporting good literature and good books in orthopedics. Um, I think we are really grateful to all the... Okay, so I think uh, we will finish here. Uh, I think Ashok has assured us that all these lectures and all these uh, discussions will be preserved on Ortho TV. So if anyone has missed it, please ask them to watch or listen or hear any of these particular lectures. And uh, again, I thank you, Ortho TV, for 
you know, taking on this program at a short notice. And we hope we will have an opportunity to work together again. Thank you very much. And I thank all the authors, the participants, the viewers. And um, good night. Yes. So we would like to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Meeting. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. Where are you? Thank you.